Welcome to Five Guys Movies and Fries. We are five guys who love movies and love talking about movies. This is a film discussion podcast. Spoiler warning, like, comment, subscribe. My name is Joe, and I'm joined by Will. Hey. Dan. Hey, old. We also got Knack. Hello. And Jeff. Yo. And the movie we're talking about today is A Streetcar Named Desire from 1952, directed by Elia Kazan, who is an infamous director from the, the old Hollywood period. He's kind of infamous in that he's controversial for selling out his friends during the, the communist witch hunting era, but that's more relevant to another movie he made called On the Waterfront. So I'd get into that, but we're, we're talking about Streetcar today. It stars Marlon Brando as Stanley, Vivian Lee as Blanche, Kim Hunter as Stella, and Carl Malden as Stanley's friend Mitch. The score is by Alex North, who has a reputation for scoring movies that are based on plays, like uh, The Children's Hour, Death of a Salesman, and uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf as well. They're all movies based on plays. It's also worth mentioning, we're doing a run of film recommendations that are all movies based on plays. We just watched Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and we're going to do three more. You guys will recommend. I'm a huge fan of movies based on plays because the character writing is so strong. There's this focus on great characters. There's minimalistic settings, literary themes. Back in the 1950s, plays were very transgressive and risque they were allowed to talk about things that you couldn't in movies and then when movies would get it or when plays would get adapted into movies they would retain some of that transgressiveness but they would tone things down and in this movie they they did tone things down a little bit i don't know if you guys know about that but i'm sure that will come I can't up can't imagine how <laughs> <laughs> the plot of this movie it's your basic typical family life that gets interrupted when the fish out of water in law comes to stay, and hilarity ensues. Not quite. It's, it's a pretty heavy drama. Hilarity? I was, what did I watch? It's like Elf or Family Matters when <laughs> Urkel joins the cast. It was hilarious. No, this, yeah, I thought this. I thought this is a prequel to The Stupids for a minute. I don't know what that is. Tom Arnold. Gold. <laughs> Gotcha. I'll look that up later. It but was, anyway, it was this, Tom Arnold's Oscar bait. Yeah, it, this is a very melodramatic movie. It's it's not a comfort movie, but I do love it a lot. On paper, the plot it's just a woman comes and stays with her sister and her brother in law. It doesn't sound amazing, but the acting is so good in this. And there's all these crazy themes. The cinematography is just so amazing. If you guys saw it in hd or 4k or whatever it, it looks amazing yeah all the lighting it did the black and white is is so good and it's mostly all just in this one setting except for a few exterior shots which were actually shot in new orleans new orleans yeah oh. new orleans <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, yeah oh man this movie it's it's cinema scorsese even says so he's a huge elia kazan head just a warning, if you haven't seen this movie, you, you probably wouldn't be watching this video or this podcast, but there's themes of domestic abuse, assault, and also Polish racism. So I'm sorry I didn't talk about the, the extreme racism in this movie. It is pretty extreme. <laughs> Jesus. It, it's not that bad. I mean, I don't know. No, but that lady does really hate Polish people. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this is a... To me, it's a great movie. I love the themes. Those are my initial thoughts. What do you What do you think, Will? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I really like this movie. Um, never seen it before. Had heard a lot of good things, um, but you know, just never had the chance to watch it. Um, I really, I really thought that the um, the soundtrack was really good that's something i really want to talk about a little bit and kind of get your guys opinions on because i just thought it was so it, it it fit the movie really well and it was it was just really strong i don't know even right out of the gates that that intro music is just like like really coming in like i don't know that that really did it for me 
Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Alex North, who, who has scored a lot of other movies. I feel like he's very underrated. And he was one of the first people to use jazz as a, in a film scores. Nice. Well, that, that right there shows that he's a fucking genius, because jazz is great. <laughs> the, the, this movie is set in the 50s, am I right? 40s or 50s, because I, I didn't mention this, but it's based on a play by Tennessee Williams. Who, who lived in New Orleans when he wrote this play. He also wrote Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, which was adapted and toned down heavily. Tennessee Williams was a gay man, and a lot of his theme, or a lot of his plays have that as a theme. In this play, it does exist as well, but it's, yeah, it either takes place in the 40s or 50s. I wanted to make sure, because I know, like, it, it seemed like it, did, it took place not long after the, like, the jazz age, so. Yeah. Or 30s and whatnot. Anyway. But yeah, the the soundtrack was just fantastic um, throughout. I uh, obviously the acting was phenomenal. Um, I it was a little rough at times, um, just because like the themes that are a little prevalent in this in this movie. Just seeing some of that shit. There, there there's like you said, there's some trigger stuff in here for sure. Um, but it's it's acted so well um, that it not necessarily makes it okay but it's like okay this is like a this is a well depicted uh it's a good it's a depiction of this that is done like well right like they it makes it look pretty realistic and it feels pretty fucked up to watch yeah i uh you mentioned that marty martin scorsese was a big fan of him i actually uh the film that i watched was the out of the box set that i own of a bunch of his films that are introduced by Martin Scorsese. And then there's actually a film that Martin made about. Yeah. Is that like a letter to Elia or a letter yeah. to. Yeah. So he basically, uh, for me, you know, I had seen this play when I think I was just too young to understand what was happening and probably bored out of my mind. Um, I was super impressed with, and I think this is just a, a general thing for all of Eli's work, but he'll take very little and make a lot with it. So this was a play, like you were saying, minimal setting. The little bit of stuff that they had outside was, you know, it was just the, the shots on the pier were just amazing. And the blocking, the camera work, the close-ups, the movement. I mean, for something that took place mostly in, you know, one kind of, room split into two with a curtain i mean just the amount of motion and i mean i I couldn't believe taking like the first time that marlon brando's character uh he's speaking to blanche and he's like you were married once were you weren't you and then she goes into like that first initial flashback uh and that does that real slow creep getting closer and closer to her and everything else just falls away. And all of a sudden Brando's just in a different world. They yeah, did that man. all in five seconds on the screen Whoa. And to do that in black and white. It was just like, Oh my God. Like I, the blocking had to be so perfect because uh, think about any one of those people stepping to the left or to the right. If Brando's in the side of the frame, it's a completely different shot. Right. It, they, it was all planned so meticulously, but as you're watching, it just feels so natural and casual. And then all of a sudden, boom, you're just snapped out of that world. And that kept happening every time uh, she would have no. these flashbacks. It was like, oh, my God. It was like you're in this solitary world that's a play. And then, bam, with these slow pulls, you're, you're out of the world. There's, there's just there's echoes. There's all these things. And it's so effective. It's not hokey. It's not like cornball effects. They're not. There's not a lightning machine in the back. It's just like, yeah. Go the ahead, Jack. Blocking in this kind of made me think of Hitchcock. All day. Like Hitchcock's blocking yeah. was really good, like this. Yes. It's the the where I noticed it the most, actually, and not to jump too far ahead in the film, but when Mitch and Blanche are out on the pier, right? Mm -hmm. Mitch is just pouring his heart out. She literally has her back to him. Hmm. And like, we're seeing the pier behind and he's like, just saying all this, like, you know, I, I've thought about you a lot and I think you, you know, all this stuff. And she's like, it's a nice night, isn't it? 
just like, oh my god, <laughs> like you cold bitch, like this. He's just like laying it out, and she's just like, hmm, like I like Twix. Do you like Twix? Just like what? <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear any of that? Like, are you in I this you. room with me? Right? Ooh. He was just like, I cut a little piece of my heart out and I put it in this jar. And I think maybe you could have it. She was like, do you think green or blue is better than the car? <laughs> like, oh, my God. And you could tell, like, just where she was. She she was so distant. Do you like and lamps? I, I like lamps. Right? Yeah. And the thing. I, I like mean, lamps, I, but I hate fans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't much care for fans. By the way, we could talk about Brando all day. Holy is he shit. James Gandolfini? That's Boo. all I want to know. Are they the same person? Fuck, I forget about the Vagoo. I went wow. a fagu, you want the fagu, I have a fagu. It was just like, bro, the whole movie, it was like Marlon Brando doing an impression of James Gandolfini doing himself. That's all I could think about. It was like, first of all, you're shooting on film and you're eating in every scene. The director hates you. He hates you with a passion. For real. Like, wow, this take was perfect. But again, Marlon with a fucking roast beef sandwich in your mouth. We're going to start again. I can't hear you. Well, what do you mean you can't fucking hear I was having lunch and the other night. I was just going to talk to her and say, look, fuck a Stella. We got it. <laughs> don't, 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 don't play dumb. <laughs> but yeah, it was an incredibly shot film. And the shot in the bowling alley. When, she, when we first see Blanche, I don't know if you guys noticed, but we never get a good look at her face until she steps into the bowling alley, right? And you see her in the mirror of the cigarette machine. Oh, I'm looking God, at her. That, that was, scene is on right now. Oh, scene. my God, that butter pull. She walks in. It's like there's a, it's like a haze in there, and you're so focused on the back of her head. She just slightly, they slightly pan camera left and just pull behind her a little bit. And all of a sudden you've got all of her reaction in that cigarette machine in the mirror. It's like, she, oh, bro. Like she doesn't realize you can see her almost. She's in a very vulnerable state. So much so that we catch her in the mirror. And I was just thought that that was like, ah, uh, brilliant. brilliant. Uh, yeah, absolutely perfect shit. But um, yeah, my initial thoughts obviously are always 40 minutes. So I'm going to. Toss it to Knack. Radio. Uh, yeah, I, I, I did enjoy watching this movie. Uh, the first time through it, I had come back from the bar, so I didn't really absorb it. But um, I, <laughs> I, I, was, I was torn about Blanche throughout most of the movie. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I just, it wasn't until towards, pretty much for the second half of the movie where I'm actually acknowledging her her trauma, her, her <laughs> lunacy. Fucking, yeah. Her you just absolutely say it. Whack -a -loon, <laughs> whack -a lunacy. <laughs> fucking, but, but I'm, I'm, st I'm, I'm, I'm stuck between trying to empathize for how she's, she's trying to deal with all the shit that she went through in, uh, Oriole. Yeah. Um, and, and also just how prissy and snot, she's such a snot rag through, throughout <laughs> 90% of the movie. It's just, I, and I have, I have really, nine. When when a character like that is just so bratty and prissy and stuck up, I I have I have trouble even attaching myself to that character at all. I think I, that's I, the point. Yeah, no, that, yeah, yep. yeah. Does it make you want to throw food and <laughs> like <laughs> smash smash things? Yeah, I'm gonna tear down lampshades and fucking. Um, that's that's men for you. Kim Hunter was so goddamn likable that anyone around her just by default seems like a piece of shit. Mm. She's like the most likable human. She's the middle ground. Right. However, mm -hmm. uh, saying that, um, it, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I don't know whether it's Vivian Lay or Lee. It's Vivian Lee. Lee. Okay. Thank you. Um, her purple. I mean, I know we'll, we'll end up getting to, uh, like acting the, the styles, acting styles, the yeah. acting styles, but, uh, like she, I know Brando is, is pretty much one of the, first actors to bring in like actual realism method yeah. styling. Oh, that's this. but Vivian 100% Lee, what I'm going to be bringing to this like, in a second here. But Vivian uh -huh. Lee, Vivian Lee does the character so well that, that, that it's me, me, me being upset on how snotty and, and unlikable she is, is, is a compliment to her acting period. Oh, she's just a, I, a powerhouse dude. Her, her eyes are, are saucer plates throughout 90% <laughs> of her fucking scenes. Like even when she's walking through the hallway with, uh, with 
with Mitch. No, with the uh, Mitch. Not Mitch. not with Mitch. With the doctor. When the doctor is oh, yeah, when yeah, the yeah. doctor comes by, her even if, even if she's listening to somebody, her eyes are just like I said, saucer plates. Mm-hmm. You could you could fit a fucking roast beef dinner on those fucking eyes. She's you know ha- haunted by her past, and uh, she's she const- she just lies constantly because she's not trying. She's trying to hide what happened to her in in Oriole. Um, what she did in Oriole. It's less yeah. what happened to her. Oh, no, 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 you're right. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Oh, shit. Speak um, on it, son. The things, the things that yeah. happened. In Let Oriole. him cook. <laughs> <laughs> but she also has, uh, uh, Blanche also has these moments of poetic reminiscence where she's, where she's talking about um, the funeral and the, uh, and the love letters that she gets from, from the boy who died. She, she just goes into, into these, wonderful statements of of just love and poetry that that that's that's also just adding to the tug of war in my brain as to how much how much i can attach myself that to shit, character that shit makes me dislike her more okay all right because she because she just she's a snake dude she okay so she pushes her ex-husband to commit suicide by the way she treats him after he comes out as a homosexual and then sleeps with a 17 year old fucking kid yeah, yeah and then moves in with her sister and pretends like she's god's gift to humanity i don't know yeah she's not a great person almost everybody in this movie is unlikable <laughs> yeah <laughs> i like how none of us jumped in like yeah totally <laughs> we're, we're kind of like processing it like all those things are true yes yeah, I, it's yeah, tough yeah. because she, i don't to be, i don't there was not a likable character in the film to I be honest it. i'll push back a little bit agree I do, I do like her character. I, like, I, I think she's charming in a way. Once you realize that she is putting on airs and pretending to be something she's not, like, I would enjoy yeah. spending time with her. Because oh. she's so poetic. I, I, think, I think it would be amusing. But, you know, she obviously did uh, sexually assault a 17-year-old student of hers, which is not I mean, great. who has in her defense, but... In her defense, yeah. Yeah. But she is pushed to breaking down and just disassociating mentally which she i don't think she deserved that in the end i mean she did a lot of things happen to her that she didn't deserve for sure i mean she, the cruise she's she, assaulted she witnesses her sister being assaulted i still don't necessarily grasp what we lost like i don't know what we lost from the tennessee williams version that may have painted a little bit clearer picture of of all I've gleaned is that they were more overt with, at the end, Marlon Brando sexually assaults her. That's what happens when the he mirror breaks. He does. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that, yeah, okay. I, I got the implication yeah. that he did. And that, I really like that because the mirror represents her fractured self. That's one of my favorite favorite parts of this movie. Nice. I have that in my notes wondering about that scene, and, and that was sort of where my head was at. But, uh, Yeah. And also, her her ex husband, as Jeff picked up on, her, her ex husband was gay, and which it they do mention coming out in this movie, but it was yeah. more prominent in the play, I believe. They really skipped over it. For everything else, they had like nineteen paragraphs of dialogue, and for that, it was like, yeah, let's get this out quick. So it's yeah, which is understandable. Yeah. Overall, it, uh, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. It really gives it this like darkness under the surface for me when they just touch on it like that yeah you know, so much other animated and like maybe not flowery but just like bombastic scenes and then there's like these things that they kind of touch on but don't really touch on so much and it just gives it like this bubbly simmery feel to me or to me yeah, yeah. overall initial thoughts i i i supremely enjoyed the movie uh like Dan was mentioning earlier about like the motion and the lighting, the, like the, the, the poker, the poker fight scene was, yeah, that, that movie was that, that seems chaos. And just seeing, seeing the motions between the motion of all the, all the actors between uh, each room and just yeah. lights getting torn down. It was, I, I couldn't look away, but and Brando in the shower, like coming to, just like yeah, well, I, yeah. Like, get out of my house. Like, just I like, got to give praise to a movie that keeps me engaged, even as unlikable as all the fucking characters were. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Jeff. Yeah, this movie kind of took me by surprise in a lot of ways. I've seen 
a lot of movies or not a lot of movies, but a handful of movies from this era. And I don't think I've seen one that's this dark. Like this movie's he close fist hits that girl on the porch. You yeah. know what I mean? Oh, yeah. like, Brando was a powerhouse to watch through this movie for me. I could not keep my fucking eyes off of him because he he was like like Nacker was mentioning earlier, one of the first people, if not credited for being the first person to bring uh, method acting to the screen. Yeah. When you put him against all these other people who are acting in a much more old school fashion, and then you have him just absolutely munching everything that he's in, it's magnetic. It's literally munching. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So method that he actually punched her in the face. I mean, they understood it was for the scene. He committed. He, he, he I didn't know that. Committing. No, he didn't. He didn't. Okay. I, I was making a joke to, about a different film that he did where some uh, <clears throat> questionable things took place in hmm. regards to Bra- Brando's method acting. Brando <laughs> had a trub- like troubled real life with women, didn't he? Yeah. I forget. Yeah. But... Anyway. Yeah. Maybe that should be our last tango <clears throat> oh, in, that, um, okay. in that area. Whoa. You do a good Brando. Perfect. It's crazy how pronounced that, that accent of his is this early. You know what I mean? Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. Yeah, it's thick. Also, was he always that jacked like For real my, my god huge. it looked insane yeah he hit the gym in order to prepare for this movie he was he was skinny before i mean that guy was swolt in yeah. this movie dude <laughs> like my god it was like it, like he took his shirt off in that first scene in, in black and white i was just like are you in physical pain right now like it just looked like he had just left the gym. Speaking of that scene, it's really interesting because Blanche is so opposed to changing in front of everyone, and she always insists everyone goes into the other room. The first scene right. she meets Stanley, he's can I? He says, "Can I take my shirt off?" She says, "Oh no, oh I don't mind," and she watches him. And yeah, as soon as they, as soon as his shirt's off and he's facing her, they they face each other, and she's just yeah, sweating. she's she's <laughs> enjoying the show. But then later on I mean, in the movie, later on in the movie, he's going to change, and she insists he does so in privacy because well, she no, no longer likes him. It's also funny that every time she says she's like basically acting as though she's practically naked, she like takes one dress off to like her <laughs> yeah. series of four dresses underneath. It's like, what <laughs> are you like? I feel like it was just like. It's like someone would open a door and she'd be like, oh, and she had like 16 layers on and a turtleneck and like wool socks and a parka. She'd be like, I'm barely dressed. Like heavens. Uh, right. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I'm surprised she didn't look like a raisin the amount of baths she took. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. There wasn't a lot to do back then. It was like a bath or eating, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> bath, eating, bowler and poke, bowling and poker. Oh, yeah. Yep. Not a bad life. <laughs> Do you guys want to talk about the themes of this movie? Yeah. Should we skip ahead to that? Sure. Yeah. So there's a lot of themes going on with this movie. You could say it's all about blue collar versus white collar, educated versus not educated, you know, working class versus uh, whatever Blanche's. But there's also <laughs> themes of mental illness, women getting older, dealing with losing their beauty is a theme as well. What what jumped out to you guys? Oh, well, for uh, one thing I did want to say is really quick is I don't know if you guys noticed the just like in uh, Glen Gary, Glen Gary, Glen Ross, the trains during the scene changes. Oh, you yeah. notice like when she went from like inside to outside, like the train was building and then like right as she. Yeah. And I it was that same thing. I felt like that was like when they would be changing sets, you know, to mm. represent inside to outside. And it was that they used that same train. I just thought that was interesting. Um, but. Uh, and, and also, yeah. I'll ask a, a more direct question. Like the, the title of the play is A Streetcar Named Desire, and it's never really explained yeah. what that means. They do reference desire well, itself. She comes in to town on 
a literal streetcar named Desire, and in the mm -hmm. figurative sense, her whole, you know, she came there on this passion cloud of like everything you were kind of explaining, you know, rec reclaiming her youth, making a fresh start yep. somewhere that she was not associated with her, you know, her fucking past. She had this strong desire to basically rid herself of this trauma and be able to function on her own. And we see that in the beginning. I was just saying there's a lot of clashing desires in this movie overall. Like Brando's character desires to like control his home and control the women in it. Um, like he desires respect. Control the narrative yeah. in regard mm -hmm. to the past. That's very true. There, it, it's all about clashing desires. I think Blanche's desire is more so to be loved. And it's it's all about men loving her because supposedly she was uh, doing sex work at the Flamingo Hotel. Right. Oh. Beforehand. Okay. And she hits on the, the young boy who was going around selling stuff. I don't remember what he was selling. Or she asks for a kiss. He was collecting for the newspaper. Oh, right. Yeah, she asks for a kiss. I think she just... She just wants to be the center of attention in a way. Well, she's the world's most codependent human. She can't function on her own. And we see that in the very first scene. She gets off the train. And the and minute the last, she steps one of the off. the thing she says. Yes. And the first thing she says. Yep. The first thing she says is, I can't. I wouldn't have made it on my own. Like, they, the, she walks in in a beautiful shot. And the homeboy's in soft focus in the far right of the frame. He, and she's like, there was supposed to be a car here. And then I walk five blocks and then I get on this car. And he's like, oh, it's right here, I'm like right in front of you. I'll just put your bag on for you and get you on the train and get you on your way. And then she goes to the next person who is the sister and she leans on her and she just can't function without without that second wheel. She's just this codependent. Yeah, She always depends on the kindness of strangers. Yep. Exactly. That's like she says. Yeah, it's just what that is. She's. She just kind of yeah. At, there's an episode of The Simpsons where that where Marge is doing this play, and right after the where Marge says, "I've always depended on the kindness of strangers." They break out <laughs> in the song. You can always depend on the kindness of strangers. Something something. Look out for danger. A stranger's <laughs> just a friend you haven't met. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's so uh, fucking funny that they just that's so good. They just get the theme completely wrong. <laughs> yep. Classic uh, Simpsons. Uh, they were so smart. Anyway. <laughs> is that an animated program? I'm, I'm not familiar. Yeah, what is this? Uh, <laughs> Simpsons? Simp and Sons? But yeah, throughout, I think the whole thing was, everybody was desiring uh, the ability to be able to respect themselves and, you know, as vicariously through getting respect from others. Brando had to be the fucking head honcho of his friend group. You know, he had to control every aspect of his life, his home you know, whatever. Um, well, the way he, yeah. the way he physically acts this scene shows the control he's taking over everybody else. Like when yeah. he starts going through Blanche's bag and her sister's trying to stop him and he just keeps pushing her away and just picking at everything. Oh, he had such an amazing line in there. <laughs> he was like, a string of pearls. Well, what is she, a deep sea diver? It's <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of fire lines it's like just, that in this it's movie. It's a pirate's treasure chest. Yeah, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh, he's so Just funny. Singing her. He's amazing. Look at these fine feathers and furs. That's a <laughs> solid gold dress, I believe. Got a fluffy, fluffy, fluffy and white is. Got to go so far north to get it this far, this white. What's she got? thousand oh, dollars worth of stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> Holy I know shit. a guy. I know a guy. I always, I always enjoy themes that focus on, uh, just fantasy and delusion so um yeah this this film shares a lot it came out the year after sunset boulevard which it shares a lot with that's the true character. yeah the, the, uh, the i mean wow um, i never thought about that you're absolutely right just just com in complete delusion and uh probably from a combination of the tr the trauma and shit shit that happened in the the pre you know oriole and and also with uh, with the actress from Sons Norma of Desmond, yeah, and they're both Thank obsessed you. with vanity and beauty. Yes, both insecure about you, losing their beauty. Do you think that was a theme at the time? Uh, not a theme, but uh, do you think that that feeling, uh, like you mentioned, like Sunset Boulevard, 
was that of that era was that something that would have been like thick in the air something very recognizable that they're pulling in a contemporary sense you know what I, I think mean? So. yeah I think with Sunset Boulevard with Sunset Boulevard in particular it was because actresses had run their course you know and they yeah. weren't able to work after their their era had gone yeah it was just in the air it was just a known you know it was just this feeling it was just yeah it, i don't you don't see this in movies today about uh you know aging being a, a huge theme yeah and i'm wondering if that's less yeah that's it, it was also i mean a lot of for for a lot of situations the woman was sort of the leading for lack of a better phrase to show you how you know where it went was the the woman was the leading man i mean shit uh, Vivian Lee, and rightfully so, got top billing on this film. Yeah, above right. Brando, yeah. and and she deserved it. I mean, she she was this film. Uh, but it it I I God, that's just a perfect. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I never, I always, I don't know why I would keep those two things so separate in my mind as far as Sunset because I haven't watched that in a minute. But you're yeah, that is that must have been so prevalent just at the time that feeling. Some people do disagree and say that, you know, Marlon Brando is the heart of this movie and his acting style kind of really? heralded well, him. I I it too. See it. Speaking of I... this, let's about about acting styles. Uh, as it's been mentioned, Marlon Brando sort of pioneered method acting, which came from Stanislavski and then Lee Strasberg in America taught the acting the method acting style to Marlon Brando. And Vivian Lee was doing the older style of acting, the Shakespearean style. Marlon Brando's style was basically showing up on set and being an asshole, chewing when he's <laughs> chewing when he's doing scenes, mumbling his lines, just an all-around minimalistic performance. But when you watch it, it's so realistic to that character. Yeah. I would I would have to yeah. say that the, even though they're using two different styles of acting, it works in the character's favor. Each character's favor. Well, it adds, it and adds, they're, they're neck absolutely. and they're neck and neck in terms of caliber, but it, it they're still noticeably two separate. You know, well, methods. thematically it works too because it, it it keeps them at even more of a distance. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it was spot on, and I would say that speaks to Kazan and his casting and direction. You know, so being able to put these two in a room. And know exactly when to tone one or the other down, when to bring one or the other up, and doing so with camera work when it when he needed to have the heavier hand, and you know and make yeah. that choice, uh, you know that really in 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 uh, in honor uh, in in light in nah I was gonna say like in defense for some reason like Kazan was on trial here or something but like in his credit to his credit <laughs> thank you. Uh, to Kazan's credit, I think part of being a, a an effective director is knowing when to let the actors act and knowing when to use a, a forced hand in the terms of in of the lens, not in the Brando sense, <laughs> slapping people around. I mean, like knowing when to tell you what to look at and what to feel, and letting <laughs> and letting you know the actors act and letting the actor sculpt the scene. A perfect balance of that in this for something that could have been completely and was completely actor based as a play. Uh just enough of a of a filmmaker's hand where it needed it and not overdoing it. Not putting things in that didn't need to be there just to me like, well no, it's different than the play because of the things I did. You know, it was like just where it needed. Uh and I, I really give him credit for that. One one thing I was curious about is that um a lot of shots with uh Blanche are, it shows her basically in the dark, but has this bright kind of focused light right on her face. But when we get to, but when we get to the pier mm -hmm. scene with, with her and Mitch, he's like, I haven't gotten a clear look at your face. How old are you? And it, that, I don't know if that, I don't know if that's yeah. just, if that was just a style of filmmaking at that time, where even though we're getting, we're, we as viewers have a clear shot of somebody's face, it's basically, it's somehow them in the dark. Am I am I wrong about that? Well, I think the guy was just full of shit and was just looking for an it, excuse to ask her how old, he, how old she was. Well, he mentions more than a couple of times. Well, like I, I, I think I've there's only a couple seen of you things. in shadows and like mm. had, had and he doesn't really get a like a he says he doesn't really get a good look at her to make that determination. But it is know. 
No, you could be right though, because she they like had right. the lamp on. She couldn't read the inscription on the inside of the, the cigarette, cigarette case. case. Well, there was supposed to be. She always stays dimly lit because she is, you know, the same way that you're dimly lit on a Zoom call because you just look, you don't want it to show how <laughs> gross you really are. You know what I mean? Like you're like, oh god, let me just turn this down. Like now that I see my face, I have to acknowledge this is how I look. That you know, we've all had that feeling, but I think. We were, you know, dynamic lighting at the time. Imagine watching this on a CRT <laughs> and getting all of those rich tones that we're not seeing in, and I don't know what cut you guys saw, but this would be a, this is a perfect example of a film that was, is going to benefit greatly mm -hmm. from that HDR and having that because it was hard to tell where they were supposed to be in the dark and where they weren't because you right. have to see them. You know, the reason that Roger Deakins is, so revered is because he will shoot something in the dark that you can still see them. And you're like, how do you do that? And he's a wizard and that's how he does that. But it's, yeah, that was a difficult thing to convey with the technology. Right. They had. I just I, didn't know, know whether I was missing a, a puzzle piece where like when, when we see, when we see a, a, a bright light, just barely circling an actor's face and it's supposed to actually be them, them in the dark. Yeah. The, thank you for clarifying. I just want to point yeah. out that uh, Carl Molden, the actor, is actually older than Vivian Lee, so him complaining about her not being young enough for him is really weird. We are uh, right on. Ready to move on to ratings, you think? I did have a couple other things. Uh, um, yeah, I just had a couple other things I wanted to touch on really quick for my notes. Um, did you guys notice how Brando always had like an acquaintance that like could do something for it for <laughs> <Yeah>. them? <laughs> I thought that was a really good running joke throughout the whole movie. I really liked that. Yeah, he knew um, every guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I got a guy. <laughs> a lawyer friend. Yeah, I got a lawyer friend. I got a I got a doctor friend who'll take a look. <laughs> um, I, was say, I was really charmed by Brando's meow. Oh, God, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Somehow, so somehow that that one little line just made me bust out laughing. He's, that was super weird. He's so crazy in this movie. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I really liked uh, when, when the gal is pointing him out and she's like, the one that's making all the rhubarb. <laughs> I thought that was a really interesting way to describe that. Oh, uh, yeah. He was he was up to like some shenanigans. Is that just like old timey speak? I guess probably. It's got to be. Way of saying like bullshit, making like, a ruckus. Is like, it because he was? No it was good. when he was fighting all the other yeah. dudes at the bowling alley. Um. Well, he also said, "Cut the rhubarb," like when he was trying to get when he was trying to get Blanche to like just be genuine. You know, like he couldn't get a straight answer out of her. He would ask her something, and then she would say like a paragraph of riddles <laughs> or whatever. You know, like he'd be like, "So where did you come from?" She's like, "Where does anyone come from? Like, what is the sun? What are we?" And he'd be like ask another question and then she would have another paragraph of whatever and then finally in the middle of one he was like cut the fucking rhubarb or whatever you know like cut yeah. the shit and so i was like oh like that's what rhubarb they could have is. gotten along at that point like it was so like, devastating that they had to fight right when she was giving birth yeah it was, it was that like, was fuck. so odd it was uh well yeah we didn't talk about this but it's obviously it's men versus women blue collar versus white collar but I, I think it's deeper than that. I think that these two characters are just always going to butt heads. They, they just don't like each other. They just don't get along. There's no way for, for these two to, to ever coexist. So, so polar opposite. Yeah. yeah. I could see that. Well, they're actually quite similar. And it's probably why they don't get along. You know, like they're both... Just, I mean, they're both very like headstrong in the sense of like, Saving face matters a lot to them. Brando does not want to be like disrespected or ever seen as like less than the head of his household or less than the captain of the bowling team or less than like the muscle of his friend group or whatever. And she is constantly worried in the same way about different things. She doesn't want to be seen as old or used up. She doesn't want to be seen as shady or as like a bad person. She doesn't want to be seen as like hysterical or like crazy. Yeah. She, you know, they're both very much aware of how the world views them, and it's driving them both to a point of becoming a parody of themselves or becoming the thing that they, you know. I think you're right. Are yeah. fighting the most. Um, and I, I guess Brando. I don't know if there was supposed to be likability 
to him in the beginning. That's the one thing I don't, I'm not clear about. I was very distracted by him just because it's, it's him on the screen. So you're like taking it all in, but I just couldn't figure out like, were we supposed to see him as very neutral, even likable in the beginning and then see the transition happen? Or was the writing on well, the I think, wall? I think he time, is likable you know? at the beginning. Their first interaction with Blanche, they're yeah. both very likable. <laughs> when he and Brando was like mm-hmm. very sweet, and then when he got wind that he was getting the wool pulled over his eyes or whatever, he got like yeah. offended by that. And I took, I was like, yeah, you know, like in my mind, like I was like, I would feel that way. You know, like somebody was at my house just like feeding me a bunch of bullshit. I'd be like, really? You think I'm <laughs> fucking dumb? You know, like. I know I work for a living, and you're like a, whatever a. She was I don't a know teacher. What she was like a a rich. Or, okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, teacher, yeah. Mm-hmm. She had an air about mm-hmm. her, or whatever. But yeah, you could I, you sympathized with that in the beginning. Mm-hmm. At least I did. It was just kind of like, oh. but then yeah, it kind of got like okay, too much. Bring it back, less likable. Uh, yeah. One more thing before we get into reviews. I just want to say, if you like this movie, On the Waterfront is also with Marlon Brando. It's a great performance. One, I mentioned this one, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? is such a crazy play. If I didn't recommend this movie, I was going to go with that one. It's, it's, it's a lot like this movie because it's just people drunk yelling at each other. And it's from the early 60s. And you just wouldn't believe what they got away with saying and doing in that movie. I'm going to recommend it someday. Virginia Woolf's been on my list for a bit. I've been meaning to put that down. Yeah. I was very torn, but I thought I, I have to do this one because I didn't think you guys had seen it. Some of you guys had seen it. So I was like, you, you've got to see this. So went with Streetcar. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. It was a good yeah. one. Hell yeah, dude. And now I have to watch the special features with Carl with Molden. Carl, Mol- like, Carl commentary Molden does probably. the commentary. That's, <laughs> That's yeah, so funny. Dude. That's so random. Hope he does it with a fan running in the background. Yeah. <laughs> I don't much care. I don't like fans. fans. And I don't much care for fans <laughs> of movies. He's like in you. a lot of them. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> He's a great character actor. I'll say that. Yeah. He's fucking awesome and scary. Like, I feel like he's going to assault me with his nose. It was an era where with people with a nose like his face. could uh, find work. And you know. solve crimes. Yeah. Could get to the bottom of shit. Uh, do you want to get into reviews or ratings? I mean, yeah. Uh, should I go first or should Will go first? Just go in the same order. Will, Will should start. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we touched on pretty much everything with this movie it's it's pretty fantastic the acting's great soundtrack's awesome cinematography is phenomenal um touches on a lot of themes that even back then were you know pretty difficult and they do it pretty well honestly um uh uh hmm i'm gonna go with let's go with an 8.75 out of 10 yeah this movie was really really good thanks joe you're welcome. Uh, Dan, what do you got? Uh, yeah, as someone that is probably less likely to put in something like this naturally, I appreciate Have you seen this before? Uh, I had not seen the... This was one of the DVDs that I had not watched yet out of this box set. I'd only seen the play... And like I said, I was so young that I just remember being like, "What?" The Did anyone happened? else think this was a musical like, like me? Because they'd seen the Simpsons episode. Okay. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Like I definitely thought. Well, like when I well, I did not from the Simpsons episode. I thought going into the play, it was a musical, uh, and was relieved to find out it wasn't. I'm not a fan of musicals, but then was like, I can't, I can't follow along with this to save my life. Um, but yeah. The film, I thought, was really well done, and I think there was a little bit, it was a little heavy-handed as far as the dialogue. And personally, I know it's based on a play, and they probably cut 75%, and this is what was left. To me, I felt like they could have maybe shaved a little bit of that down, personally. that My only criticism would be that. A bit of it felt redundant to me. Um, overall, solid 8 out of 10. Loved every frame. 
and would highly recommend for anyone that enjoys just a great captain awesome. story what do you got nick yeah yeah um overall well enjoyed i mean it it uh it definitely has it, but between the the themes and the and the acting styles the the i'm not sure how it compares to the play because i know i don't know if any of us have even really like taken the time to watch the plays that these movies are based off of but it'd be it'd be i i would definitely set aside the time to to watch a, a performance of it but uh i i give it a, a solid nine out of ten uh i can't really place what the deductions are for whether it would be um you know the polish racism and things like that but that's uh that's i guess that's where i'm landing my one point deduction is just the general general uh things it suffers for for its time but overall awesome. well liked overall awesome. very well liked this is a solid 10 out of 10 for me my guy oh wow I like just about everything in this movie i can't nice. think of a single thing i didn't like i thought it was awesome. just it, it, Love it. it feels like once again, lightning in a bottle. Like it feels like just having having these two actors across from each other with the theme of this movie being what it is and just the way that it's shot and edited. It's I don't know, it's perfect. Definite ten out of ten for me. I'm give I'm giving it a a oh, yeah. nine out of ten. Like I Ooh. I think it, it it's for the most part it is perfect, but there's a few melodramatic moments that I I feel like it's it drags a little bit with that, but it it's 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 excellent. Yeah, and I'm glad I recommended it. It's you had uh, seen it before, yeah. Oh yeah, I'd seen it a couple times. Actually, I saw it on a plane once, and there was an old lady next to me who saw me watching it. So then she put it on, <laughs> and she turned it off pretty quickly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh no. Um, I'm, no, yeah. Uh, so, uh, who's, who's going next? Dan. Dan has our next recommendation. Dan, did you know that? Yes, <laughs> yes. So, where do I, you like, just, Well, right now, the, you can just say it. You can uh, just tell us what you want to recommend, and then we'll... Oh, I have to have it, like, ready right now. Oh, fuck me. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I thought that my fault... Uh, I have it narrowed down to like four. Can I t- can I put it in? Yeah, the chat can, tonight. We can. Well, we'll I have, we've handled it that way before. We can. Uh, we we can. I don't, think, I don't think we my have. My fault, dude. I don't uh, think we have. We've we've we always can, uh, had a tease, but we can, we can do that. Uh, not a problem. Let, well, my fault. Else, let me else, just. It, uh, that's gonna know. say. We could just slap the title into a comment or a description of the when we post it. Well, so. and, and and Joe could easily just like add Fuck. in like him uh, being like, by the way, the wreck is this like at the end of the pod. I mean, that would take like 20 Fuck, seconds. That's you know? my fault. No worries. Could, what if I recorded it See, there you go. and like had it in? Could you just cut it in? Like uh, my recommendation is going to be yeah. blah. Yeah. And then. 12 Angry Men